on government reaching limits on economic control. We tend to assume that a booming economy allows government to grow, but one thing that is not so well accepted is that prosperity demands government growth, not just due to having more resources but because a government that does not grow with prosperity risks the crises of overproduction. The tools for dealing with overproduction however are one-way ratchets and eventually lead into a coffin corner, to borrow an aviation term, where government is both too large for the economy to support, and too small to fix things. This only ends one way and while Joseph Tainter's work, in particular his The Collapse of Complex Societies, is of particular importance, there are very basic reasons why this is the case and why industrial societies are particularly vulnerable. For those who do not know the coffin corner reference, this occurs when an aircraft flies too high and can both be traveling too slow to generate enough lift, and at the same time too fast to generate lift. I believe we are headed right into a financial coffin corner with our government, making it too big, too pervasive, and too large, in order to support an economy that cannot be sustained. It's called a coffin corner for a reason though. One of the fundamental problems of a capitalistic industrial economy is the problem of overproduction. It is basically the case that it is possible for an industry to produce more of something than is needed, which causes prices to fall and the producers to become bankrupt. This is a widely understood problem in economics evoking discussions and attempted solutions from Henry George, Karl Marx, and John Maynard Keynes. This is also a fundamental basis for government action relative to the economy. Overproduction is why the libertarian approach won't work in practice in an industrialized economy, though in non-industrialized economies, it is not so much of a problem since human scale production is limited mostly by the people doing the labor. Food is particularly vulnerable to overproduction because each individual only needs a certain amount of it. It often does not have a capacity for reuse, and natural foods have a relatively finite shelf life. Some things, like grains, do better than other things, like lettuce, but on the whole, there's only so much you can sell. The Green Revolution may have made industrial farming possible, but then it also made farming into something which was prone to overproduction crises instead of underproduction ones. We have avoided overproduction crises and grown our economy through two means for the past half century and both of these are reaching limits of what can be done. The first method is by managing the fractional reserve banking system through both the reserve rate and the short term feds lending rate, and the second is through general growth of government. These are two sides of the same coin, as the first aims to increase consumption and the less reduces production. The problem with this system is that there is constant downward pressure on both reserve requirements and the federal funds rate. For the reserve requirements, the problem is that, in the real world, banks loan money, create deposits in the process, and look for the reserves later. Money is one of those things that the more you look at it, the less sense it makes. Reserve balances suffer from constant downwards pressure. Adjusting the rate is a very blunt instrument and so raising the rate is out of the question. If the Fed ever raises the required reserves, they will get immediately blamed for banks loaning less money, so that won't happen, but interest rates are also under constant downward pressure. The problem here is that the banks make a lot of secured loans, and they cover their risk with interest. This sounds like high interest rates would be to the advantage of the banks, but for many purchases, particularly homes, the monthly payment is what is important and the risk in the difference of the home's discounted value today versus the loan value. For these purchases, the monthly payment gets divided and part of it goes to the bank. If the interest rate goes down, the portion of the money that the bank's taken on each of the payments goes down also, but so does the risk, at least on home loans. Lower interest rates mean that a higher sticker price results in the same monthly payment which means that the prices of the homes become inflated compared to with a higher interest rate and the banks take on less risk. The other side to government management of the economy though is in removing workers and from production. Banking policies that inflate imaginary paper wealth in order to spur consumption are one half of the equation. The other side is in reducing that production. Farm subsidies that pay farmers not to grow things and strategic stockpiles of cheese may sound absolutely insane from a common sense perspective but they have to be considered in the context of an overproductive farming system. These are thus indispensable price supports for farmers for the reason that otherwise we'd produce too much, causing farmers to go bust, 
From this perspective a lot of things that governments do that seems totally unnecessary are part of the process of removing workers from private industry. Regulation which slows down industry also addresses this problem. So increasing paperwork is another way to avoid overproduction. However productivity places an upward pressure on the size of all levels of government. Now this could be accomplished by paying people to dig ditches and then fill them in again. But it is not possible to sell the public benefits of such soil disturbance programs and so something has to be done which sounds plausibly good. So we have upwards pressure on size of government in order to throttle production during times of prosperity, along with downwards pressure on interest rates and reserves in order to increase consumption. During hard times, there is downward pressure on interest rates and reserve requirements in order to jumpstart consumption but upward pressure on government to do something more to jumpstart consumption. These, regardless of the theory, become one-way ratchets unresponsive to extrinsic factors. This all works in a world of cheap energy, where production continues to increase over and over due to easy access to lots of cheap energy. However, what happens when when that is no longer the case? What are the options? How do the pressures change? The problem is that the pressure on government to jumpstart consumption don't change. The common sense solution of importing less and exporting more is beyond consideration. Instead the increasing consumption increases the trade deficit, which transfers wealth to other countries. Interest rates can't go below zero, and the federal funds rate is now below 0.1%. In the past we just reduced the interest rate to spur the economy but today we have used up that tool. But similarly the public sector is very large, and intractably connected to a very large number of things in complex ways. We are to the point where our laws are so complex that almost any attempt to reform anything will make it worse. Solving this problem is particularly thorny because we are so dependent on solutions already in place. I would argue we can't solve it in the context of a heavily industrial economy because there is no other way to throttle production. Solving the problem would involve taxing businesses heavily based on size, imposing high energy taxes, walking away from industrial scale anything, particularly farming, and devolving power to local authorities. This isn't going to happen. However the general problems of government in general relative to the economy are less dire than the problems of military spending, which will be my next post.